Uh, good afternoon. What uh, amazing weather we're having today. Uh, I expect you might be out in the sunshine while I'm actually broadcasting this and you may catch up with this later. Uh, so I hope you're having a great time. Today I thought I would talk about something uh, slightly differently. I'm usually talking about uh, how to support and uh, help your children, how to be uh, a good parent in lots of different ways. Uh, today I thought I would talk about how to be a good partner, which of course is part of the key to a harmonious home. And sometimes uh, we, by not getting on with our partner, cause uh, anxiety and stress and insecurity for our children. It could be because we're arguing, it could be because we're going about things in completely different ways. It could be um, because uh, we're, we're not we're so busy taken up with these issues. We're not giving our children the, sort of the time and support that they need. So uh, I'm, I've got some underlying principles really to sort of look at your own relationship with your co-partner. I might just stop the clock because it's going to bong me again in a minute. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, and um, so this is also good for people who are not living with their children at the moment. So I'm, I'm just going to go through some principles. I'm not going to be able to go through every outworking of every scenario, but I hope that you'll be able to apply these principles to your situation. I'll try and give some examples as we're going through. So your relationship with your partner. Uh, we're more affected than we like to give credit to by uh, from our own parents and our own backgrounds. And often these sort of values that we've been given, the examples of behaviour that we've been set, influence our own behaviour more than we um, like to admit, but also the unspoken expectations of how our partner should behave. And so sometimes our disagreement uh, goes right back to our own childhood. So it's, it's good before you take any further action as a, a couple, if you could find time, it'd be interesting to do this together, but just to reflect what uh, is your own background telling you or giving you in terms of values and behaviours? Uh, they're, sometimes they're fantastic, but sometimes they're unhealthy. Uh, but often the clash between your background and your um, partner's background can also cause a clash just because they're different and you don't analyse it and look at it. So let me give you our example. Um, I came from a home that had a Christian faith in it. My husband came from a home that did not have any faith in it, really. Um, he, his parents were, did not have a good dynamic between them. And one of them had a, an affair for a long time, but continued to live at home, which you can imagine did not help anyone. Uh, one of them had uh, not grown up with her own parents, but due to other circumstances, it had to live with another family and that affected her. And um, one of them was um, very much the baby of the family and very spoilt and indulged all his childhood. So that had massive impact on how they parented and on what he's taken uh, from that. Uh, for me, Although I came from a faith household, uh, my dad died when we were children and that massively affected um, how I how my mum interacted with us. Of course, we were all grieving, which affected us enormously. And, um, and I don't really have a role model of what it looks like to have a co-partner in a parenting situation. So I often overlook my husband when we're talking about Things or making decisions about things, and I only think about the children. Um, it didn't occur to me, for example, when we were making wills to say that I would leave stuff to him if I died first. That never even entered my head, and he was actually quite hurt by that. I just said, oh, I'll leave everything to the kids um, without even thinking about him. Um, so there are things there that uh, we need to sort of go through ourselves and I wonder what yours are and I would leave you obviously to think about 
how these um, different aspects of the role models that you've got of parenting affected affects you or if you don't have children just literally what the dynamic of your parents was how they handled emotion between them how they handled disagreement um, what the expectation of one was of the other and did they were they harmonious over that or not so that's something for you to think about the second thing I want to suggest to you is that we all handle emotion differently. And I would say that uh, it's true that strong emotions, our strongest emotions of um, anger and grief and fear are all really negative emotions. They are our strongest. And we often react in those ways without um, you know, sort of, uh, we, we just have our own instinctive way of handling those strong emotions, those negative things. And often we might be feeling anxious, but it comes out as anger. I'm going to come on to that a little bit more in a minute. But what is your default way of expressing these strong negative emotions? Because these are often the things that cause a problem, aren't they? Are you the bull in the china shop? That's me. I blurt it all out i explode oh i can't believe blah 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 blah. um i say it and once you've said it you can't put it back you've hurt people's feelings and it's it can be a real problem you can cause real damage just by exploding are you the opposite someone who holds it all in and bottles it up a passive person so you've got aggressive which is kind of me my style you've got a passive person who's like well I'll just keep it all inside. I'm not going to respond anything for a quiet life. Um, but of course, that means you're not processing your anger, that you're that you're sort of building up this picture of layer on layer inside of you of all the bad or in just ways that your um, partner is uh, sort of speaking with you, dealing with you uh, managing situations. And it just you're just building up more and more of a problem inside It's damaging you. And ultimately, although you may not be exploding it, it is causing you to change your the way you approach them. It's beginning to cause uh, that wedge between you, just the same as if you had exploded. And then there's a third one, which is the silent seether, or we might say passive aggressive. So we've had passive, we've had aggressive, and this is passive aggressive. This is someone who may not explode, but they don't bottle it up either. They create an atmosphere, they pout, they sulk, they slam the door, they throw your dinner down in front of you and you know, walk away and feel very, you know, um, there's all those sorts of ways. You know, they might be sarcastic, they might tease, they might leave notes around the house. So uh, a note on top of the loo for the children. Please remember to flush the toilet. Um, none of these are great because they all cause irritation and resentment and hurt. There is a fourth one, assertive, which explains and understands the feeling. It understands how the other person is feeling and works constructively towards a resolution, which sounds annoyingly too good to be true. But we'll come on to ways, tips and hacks of how to be more like that later. I just want to say um, something about anger. Anger is something a, a person of faith would say is God given it's, or someone else would say it's just part of our makeup. And it is. And it's a good thing. It makes us want to put things right when they're wrong. It makes us want to, to you know, stop putting plastic in the oceans and uh, fight for, you know, the rights of refugees and, you know, the underdog and you know, make things good in the world. So anger is, you know, a, a good thing. But how we express anger uh, is what is harmful. And anger is often the tip of an iceberg. So I might behave in an angry fashion. But in fact, that's the secondary emotion. That's how it is expressed. 
but underneath, under the waves, if you're thinking of us as an iceberg, there are much deeper feelings. Uh, feelings um, that are really powerful and might make us angry because we're feeling defensive or under threat in some way. So I'll just give you an example of what some of these might be. So a primary emotion that underlies your anger might be jealousy or worry or fear or insecurity or disappointment or rejection or guilt. So before I give an example of um, how that might be, I'm just going to ask you uh, something else. What are your triggers? What makes you feel these things, angry or jealous or rejected or disappointed, that makes you behave angrily? Now, we have many triggers and it's good to understand what ours are. It's also good to understand what our partner's triggers are. Um, because these are the things that will make them flash up and be angry and we don't understand. To us, it seems unreasonable, an irrational reaction. And it makes us defensive. And then we have an argument. We don't even know what we're arguing about. Um, but we both feel attacked or unappreciated. So some triggers might be um, you're anxious about money. That might go back to your childhood. Or it might be because of another reason. Uh, stress at work might make it might you might keep it bottled in at work and then explode at home um your partner's social life that's associated with their work or perhaps they travel a lot and you don't and you feel jealous or insecure because of it um job security maybe you know your whole life feels threatened because you don't know if you'll have a job at the end of this or maybe you know it's already gone or it's it's under threat health um, it could be that somebody uh, in your household or someone else you're related to has health issues or bereavement is a kind of, I was going to say temporary, but semi-temporary because it can take years to process bereavement and grief. Uh, exhaustion, you're running around doing everything for the whole family all the time and working and you are exhausted. And when you're exhausted, that triggers um, a, an angry reaction. There might be some things that are always there and some things that are new because of COVID or just might only exist during COVID. The, the sort of the, the underlying difficulties of having the children at home whilst both working and managing homeschooling and all the rest of it. So I'm going to give an example and, and I want to say that all these things that I've talked about, um, how we respond to anger, whether we bottle it up or explode, having particular triggers and our own sort of background baggage, uh, uh, the home culture that we've come from, all kind of affect us and put those filters on us. So when we're in a situation with our partner and we have that angry reaction, we're kind of starting somewhere in the middle of all these different things. And it's hard for our uh, partner to kind of know where it's coming from or why we're behaving like this. So imagine two um, partners, they both work full time. Uh, the husband finishes his work and he comes down from the study or the spare room, whatever, and says, what's for dinner? Now, his partner is also working full time, has got the same pressures. Uh, but when she manages to produce a frozen pizza, he kind of feels that he's not respected or appreciated or loved as he should be because he's not getting at the dinner that kind of, maybe his mum always made for their family growing up. So, you know, he he's not appreciative of of the fact that she's gone to this trouble. What does she feel, though? She might feel guilty that she can't do better. She might feel annoyed or irritated that the burden of the food seems to always fall on her. She might feel defensive because she's done her best and it's not appreciated. But they'll both sit down to that pizza with their own filters on, feeling annoyed by their partner. Even if they don't have an annoyed conversation, it's kind of underneath, underlying for both of them. They're both feeling dissatisfied. 
does does that sound like a sort of situation that you might um identify with at some level maybe not its food it might be something else so i would say at this point with your partner it's good to be able to talk about maybe take some time get a takeaway and a bottle of wine in and maybe just spend some time thinking about um, what are your triggers um what are the things that that suddenly make you feel angry and perhaps respond angrily what's in the background what expectations or understanding of family life do you have because of how your parents were and your upbringing um, and think about what actually lies behind some of your the arguments is it because in fact you know the husband might feel uh, insecure that his wife has also got a fulfilling job and maybe feels that it's that he is not the whole focus of his wife's attention like it was with his parents. Um, he might feel insecure or disappointed. He might be jealous of her job and the attention that it gets. He might worry. You know, she might feel guilty. She might feel uh, rejected because he doesn't appreciate her efforts that he makes uh, you know there's, there's all kinds of things that might make her feel insecure that we'll never get a good foundation i always feel that i'm defensive or not good enough for him so it's good to try and understand from your partner's point of view what their background is what their triggers are and understand how each of you responds to angry feelings. Often, um, you, once we've got this, we can sort of check in with this when it's actually happening and understand. Even if I don't, if I don't say to my husband, "Oh, this happened because you know your dad was um, lacked understanding always. He was quite selfish at home." I, I just know it, so I can make allowances for him when um, his behaviour is like that. It doesn't mean to say we don't need to address some of the ways in which it's expressed in our home, but I understand it. So that gives me a different way of reacting uh, to, to him when he is behaving like that. Now, if you forget everything else, I want to um, just give you this quote. I wrote this down in um, a conference the lady was actually talking about something else, not sort of um, uh, anger issues at home. She was talking about something else completely. But this was such a nugget of gold that it will help all of us. If you forget everything else I say, remember this. And I quote, a healthy relationship is based on understanding, not on agreement. Do not layer bad intention on disagreement. We are all for human flourishing, although we may disagree on the method. So a healthy relationship is built on understanding. So I understand my partner and his approaches to life because of his background. And that, that gives us a healthy relationship. And hopefully he understands mine. We don't have to agree on everything, but to be understood Totally, truly understood is such a blessing, isn't it? And that's what we want from our partner, really. Often the things that attracted us are because we are different from each other. And we need to remember that some of these things that we live with now are part of the attraction. Don't layer bad intention on disagreement. So uh, six months ago, I would have said perhaps you both um, voted differently on Brexit. Um, and you might argue about, I can't believe that you voted like that. Do you really not care about the future of our country? Of course, we just have different approaches to the, what is good. We both want good. We just think there's different routes to it. Um, but now I might say uh, you might be disagreeing about whether to send a child or children back to school in June. And one of you might be very much for it and one of you might be against it. And your temptation is to say, I can't believe you would endanger this whole household 
um, by sending him to school. The other one might say, I can't believe that you would um, sacrifice our child's well-being um, because, because of your approach to, to um, this whole situation. You, you both want something, a good outcome for your household. You both want it to be enriched. You just have different approaches to the same um, situation. So that's something that you need to, once you understand, we both want the best for this house. We both want the best for this child. I've got a trigger that is a health trigger. You've got a trigger that is um, maybe the, the chaos in the house and the stimulation is sort of juggling that and the stimulation for our children, a sort of well-being issue for him. So, um, so you agree you both want the best outcome, you agree that you've got different approaches to it, but don't say um, that you know you're you don't want a good outcome, don't layer a bad intention on the disagreement of how best to achieve it. So thinking about being assertive and finding helpful ways through, what can I actually give you that are tools to um, uh, approach anger uh, and disagreement and um, dissension better? Well, first of all, uh, if you have children, it's better to wait until you can both sit down and the children aren't around. But in any case, it's better to do it when you can both sit down and give it your full attention. So that might mean in the evening after you finish work. Uh, it's really important if you do have children that you try not to create um, that um, stress for them, that you'll give them insecurity and anxiety and all those underlying primary deep feelings that are hard to express and might come out in anger or tantrums. Um, slamming the doors and all the things that older children do because of the anxiety, the anxious situation we're creating in the home. So do try and keep it at a time when you can sit down together in private. You need to acknowledge why and how you've reacted like this. You know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I know I always get anxious when we're talking about health or money. Or I know it's because, I, you know, work is really putting pressure on me. I'm sorry that it's that's ramp this up. Um, you might also uh, sort of just want to say, you know, I'm really sorry. And this goes back to me after my father died. And I, I just have no real sort of role model of how to navigate this. And so I'm now I'm treating you like you are a child and I'm your mother because I haven't got another example. I'm sorry. Uh, so just acknowledge what it might be in your background. One good thing that people often say is don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, if you can, deal with it today, but deal with it as soon as possible. Uh, agree when that will be. If you have to put a date in the diary, do it. Uh, and try not to let it needle and niggle and keep giving those little snide remarks. Try to um, just keep it for that time when you can deal with it constructively. So there are two skills I want to give you to help you when you actually sit down to talk. Um, and neither of them are rocket science, um, but when you unpick it and talk about it, it actually helps you to put a, a really helpful way in place. So the first thing is, I said it's not rocket science, listening. So the principle we all know, and I struggle with this, is two of these, one of these. So we need to try and listen twice as much as we speak. So uh, I know for some men, it's actually helpful for them to talk about emotions when they're maybe not looking eye to eye with their partner. And if that's, or whoever, if that's true for you, then maybe it's a good way to start um, uh, to sort of broach this initially by maybe when you're doing the washing up together or doing gardening. Or you may just say, it's best if we kind of sit side by side. If we sit opposite each other across the table, it's really hard for me to look you in the eye and say this. For men, it's often easy to kind of talk 
over their shoulder. So you may want to sit side by side on the sofa, on the bench in the garden, go for a walk. Uh, that's often quite a good way to talk things out on a walk. Sit in the car together. <laughs> Your kids are old enough to leave them in the house. Sitting in the car uh, is, is a great way to, to do it. Or go and drive and watch a sunset. And uh, if you can leave the house together and maybe do it that way. Um, but uh, so just find a way in which you can both talk about your feelings constructively. Eye contact does help because you know someone is really listening to you when they look at you and um, and nod, doing basically that nodding, saying, mm, OK, mm -hmm. I see. That, that sort of thing is actually really helpful because you know somebody's really listening. But having said, mm hmm, uh -huh, okay, don't interrupt. Don't go, oh, yeah, I know. I, I want to just, uh, and I do that all the time. And I've had to ask my husband to not sit in this room when I'm uh, broadcasting this because he will snort in derision uh, if I say that and he's here. He will, uh, because I'm really bad at interrupting. So be patient. It takes people a long time to kind of get their emotions out, their feelings out. But it is their feelings. It is their, how they see it from their point of view. It is their reality. So respect it. Respect what they're saying. And if, even if you disagree 100%, it is true for them. So remember that. Um, as they're speaking, try and imagine what it's like to be them and have those feelings or have that sort of background that's sort of colouring how they view what's happening. The key is when we're listening to understand, not to agree, but to see it from their point of view so that we can revisit that situation, looking at it from their point of view and seeing how they've reacted to what we've said or done or the situation that is there. Um, rather than saying, oh, they're just making a fuss over nothing. I can't get this at all. Um, to see it from their point of view. Once you see it from their point of view and why it's a problem for them, then you together can improve it. So that's the first thing to really take time to zip the lip, open the ears and, and try and put yourself in their shoes and understand. And the second thing I would say, when you're talking about your feelings, I'm sure I've said this in other things, uh, other scenarios, but um, use an I message, not a you message. So um, you never make me dinners that make me, that, you know, really show that you love me. Terrible. Because now she's going, well, hang on a minute. You don't acknowledge that I work just as hard as you. Okay, so try a different approach. Try to just say something like, um, I feel so disappointed when we can't sit down and enjoy a meal after a hard day's work. Uh, you might want to say uh, something like, um, I feel that I'm not valued because this is something that was always, always happened at home. And my mum and dad had a really good dynamic. And um, they could respect each other and this is one way that, that it came out. Um, on the other hand, the other partner want, might want to say, I actually feel guilty that I don't make dinners like your mum did. But I also feel exhausted at the end of the day. I, I feel it's not fair that the expectation is 90% is of the time or 100% of the time on me to produce the meal for everybody. So an I message actually helps you to explain it without having an argument. But you do need the discipline to stick to I feel, I feel. The next thing is to acknowledge or to, uh, how your partner feels and to affirm them in that. To say, uh, I appreciate how hard you work, actually. I appreciate what you bring into this family, how it's helping us to feel more secure financially. Um, I do understand it may not be possible for you to, to do the kind of meal that my mum always did because she, she only worked part time or she didn't work. Um, 
but the other one might say, I appreciate that you, you want to feel loved at home, that you want it to be a little haven of happy family life and you don't feel that it is that at the moment. So acknowledge, understand, put yourself in the other person's shoe and just say, I, I understand. I do appreciate, I do acknowledge. Now, third step, find a joint solution. Now, this means changing how you both approach the situation. So for meals, it might be, um, uh, actually, I can see it's not fair that you always end up having to do the meal. You're as exhausted as I am. Uh, you might also be you know, doing other things, juggling the kids more than I do or um, whatever it is. So perhaps we'll agree that we'll we'll take turns on doing meals. So I, the part the female partner in this case might do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, two days a week. Um, you know, the male partner will do it. And once you've taken the burden off, it's actually really nice to try and be creative and try and treat the other person, uh, and and just do things differently. It might only still be a quick carbonara. But maybe put paper napkins on the table. Now it's your turn or lay it out in the garden. It's a beautiful evening. Or, you know, just say, Let, let's let's picnic outside today. I've packed, you know, it's only a bought quiche and some and a bag of salad and a crusty loaf. But I'm going to, well, now we'll take you to the front garden or the back garden, isn't it? Or to the park. But let's do something different. Let's do something out of the box. It might be something more practical, like, um, OK, I can see this is a problem. What if we get one of those um, pre weighed out box meals, you know, when you get all the ingredients and the instructions to create something that's a really nice meal like mum used to make um, that we can maybe do together one night a week or one night a month just to mix it up or um, why don't we say Friday night is takeaway night and give us both a treat at the end of the week? Or you could say, well, normally let's sit down at the table, but on a certain night of the week, we do this in our house on a Saturday night. We do beans on toast, which is the easiest meal in the world, but in front of the telly. Um, so again, mixing it up to make a treat of an easy meal. So be, find creative solutions. And you might also then, if this were your thing, you might want to say, well, why don't we kind of work together on a, a slap up meal on a Sunday lunchtime or a Saturday night um, and uh, and have a bottle of wine uh, and just make it into something you're doing together to, to sort of meet that need for um, that special part of family life uh, for, for one of the partners. This is sitting down together to a special meal. So I wonder what the uh, areas of tension are for you. I wonder uh, what you might um, what you might take away from this. So let me just summarise. I've said all I'm going to say. So let me say my quote again. A healthy relationship is based on understanding, not on agreement. Don't lay a bad intention on disagreement. We are all for human flourishing or for our family flourishing, although we may disagree on the method. So in order to um, get to that space, you might need to look back at your own um, family, your own upbringing and the example, good or bad, that your, um, your parents were. You might want to um, look at how you respond uh, emotionally, uh, particularly angry emotions and how that is a problem to your partner or how that drives a wedge between you. You might want to um, think about what your triggers are, what are the things that makes you anxious and, um, and makes you respond like that. And you, you might want to analyse, well actually I behaved angrily but I'm feeling one of these other seven things jealousy, insecurity, worry, um, what are the others? Let me see if I can find them. Guilt, fear, disappointment, rejection. So it's good to sort of look at those things and just think what you are actually feeling when you behave angrily. 
And uh, it's good to then find new ways of doing it. I agree a time when you'll look at these things, when you can just be together and how you'll do it, where you'll do it. It's uh, good to listen. Remember two of these and one of these. And as you're listening, to put yourself in your partner's shoes. That's when we really change things, when we understand what is behind their actions and really appreciate that for them. To express things by explaining what it is for me, I feel actually this or that or the other. To acknowledge each other's feelings and to agree on a solution that involves both of you changing. So I hope that's helpful. And um, uh, just a caveat to this, um, sometimes it's not possible to change because the relationship might actually be an imbalanced one, an abusive one, where one partner is um, wielding too much power, exerting undue stress on the other one. And no matter how the other one changes, they don't change the way in which they react to that. And I would say if that is true for you, you do need to find help if you're totally constantly buried uh, and no matter what solution you try and find, your partner continues to bury you in uh, layers of difficulty. So if that is true for you, then you do need to seek help. On our Facebook page, I'm putting at the top um, banners that say uh, if you are worried for your safety and there's a load of uh, or somebody else's safety, maybe a child's safety, or somebody else you know, a whole list of um, contact details or you could contact us through our Facebook page and the same also in fact for addictive behaviours, other things you might be struggling with in the house, whether that's gaming or uh, looking up things that aren't helpful or um, other addictive behaviours that we think of, these are drink, drugs, alcohol, um, etc. So um, I'll put those up on our Facebook page again and uh, on the banner so you can click through and find the helps there. Okay, that's it for this time. I'll see you next Wednesday for some more parenting in a pandemic. And uh, I haven't decided what that would be. If you want me to talk about something particular, let me know. Um, but um, uh, otherwise, uh, I will uh, choose something and talk about something to do with our children again. So uh, I'll see you then.